Welcome back to the Herberger Online Office Hours for the summer of 2020, uh, where the goal is to bring together faculty and instructional designers to talk about the crucial issues in online teaching and in higher ed. I'm Tim McKean. I'm an instructional designer with the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts at ASU. And let's meet our guest panelists today. My name is Randy Redman. I'm a professor at St. Louis University. I teach English for international students within the program of Into SLU. Hi, I'm Carrie Koch. I am a professor, associate professor with the Arizona State University's Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts in the School of Music, Dance, and Theater. That's all the initials that I was talking about. Uh, I'm the, <laughs> stop and think of the full words. And uh, I am the, in addition to being a, a professor, I'm also the production manager for live performances. Wow, that's great. I'm so glad for you guys both to be able to join us today. Today we're talking about uh, the topic of instructor-created video and uh, the work of Michael Wesch, who has discussed on the EdSurge podcast. Um, have either of you uh, dabbled with or tried creating your own instructional video? Yeah, I've created a couple, I would say maybe, I don't know, somewhere between 10 to 15 instructional videos using uh, Panopto is the video um, editor and recording software that we have here at SLU. Um, prior to that at Oregon State, I used uh, Kaltura was the, the program they use there. So I have a little bit of experience. Yeah. And you said, Carrie, you haven't, uh, you haven't tried that at all? No, I have not. I, I, when we were forced to uh, move everything online in March, I taught all my classes synchronously. So I was live on Zoom. Mm -hmm. A lot day. of Zoom. Yeah. As you were uh, listening to the discussion uh, with Michael Wesch, were there any kind of key things that stood out to you or, or things that resonated with your experience? Carrie might have to go on this one. I wasn't able to, I just got back into town, so I wasn't able to actually watch the, or listen to the podcast. No problem. I will also admit that I, I haven't watched it. Okay. So one of the key uh, things that stood out to me and uh, was this idea, he talks about being, uh, you know, his experience starting to uh, learn to create instructor video and uh, being nervous on camera and, and, that, and that was a thing. And, and Randy, you may have experienced that kind of thing as well, that, that uh, it's, it's the minute the lights come on or the minute the camera is recording, all of a sudden you don't remember what you were going to say or you, you feel... It, it's different. It's, a, it's, I mean, it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of stage fright. It's a kind of performance anxiety. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and maybe, uh, what your experience was or have you, have you felt like you've overcome that? Definitely the first, uh, couple of videos that I was recording. I, I think I must've re-recorded probably like five or six different times. Um, mm -hmm. and then I would listen to it and I was like, that's terrible. And then I would mess up my words, uh, and I think still I was working on this this morning, actually trying to create a video. And I think I messed up like two or three different times. And um, so I still have moments where I, I don't like <laughs> what I produce, um, but I think I've gotten to where I, I'm able to live with, um, you know, maybe a second or third recording. And I'm like, okay, that's good enough. Um, mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's, it's okay to have some mistakes in there that kind of humanizes you and say, Hey, I'm not, I'm not perfect. This isn't going to be, you know, broadcast quality video. So right. I've been trying to work, you know, over getting over that kind of like, you know, I guess you might call it an internal editor um, saying that, you know, that isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really like that concept of humanizing. I think that's a, that's a huge thing that we have to struggle with in, in all of online learning is, is really highlighting that human element uh, that, uh, that students are are learning from us. They're learning from you. They're learning from their instructor. They're not learning from the computer. And that's a really important distinction that the, the computer, the technology, uh, Canvas, Zoom, whatever tools are between you and your students, uh, that that's not the topic, you know, that that's not the teacher. That's just the tool that you're using to communicate. And I think that's, uh, that's incredibly important, that human element. One of the topics he talks about is this idea of super simple video. And I think this plays on to Randy, what you were saying of, 
this maybe this distinction between video that is highly produced versus video that is just record and go kind of kind of video. And I think one of the things that I'm seeing, and I've been producing instructional video uh, for my own courses and for courses that I've developed as an instructional designer um, for probably about 15 years now, um, is that you, you, you quickly reach a threshold of where quality doesn't make it any better of a learning experience, right? There is certainly an element of if your image is too hard to see or if your audio, audio is probably the most important thing. If your audio isn't clear and hard to understand, then students can't learn from that and that's distracting and, they're, and you're not gonna keep their attention very long. Um, but once you hit a threshold of things are clear enough, I can hear and understand you nicely, um, then graphic effects, you know, green screen effects, other things like that are just polish. They're just sprinkles on top of your cake. Um, and they don't actually make it more instructional. Uh, they might make it slightly more engaging or enjoyable to watch. Um, but, but we, like I said, we quickly hit that threshold of diminishing returns where good enough is, is probably good enough. Um, and even to the point that having the mistakes, having the ums and ahs, or having your son walk in the door and ask you a question um, or your, your pet come in and jump up on your lap. Um, those are very humanizing things. Those are real things. And that helps to solidify that idea that you're a real person dealing with real struggles just like they are. Um, and I think that actually can bring a lot of value to, to instructional videos. As you look around on, on YouTube or, or courses that you've taken, um, have you seen some good examples of, of instructor created videos or instructional videos that you would like to emulate? Yeah, I think one of the video set of videos I was looking at when we kind of transitioned to remote learning was, I think it's, is it the ACUE? Um, there was a set of videos they put up and I was kind of looking at them. I think it's the same speaker that was in the podcast. Um, set up some of the videos and mm -hmm. I, and there was like the welcome video and I was like I felt like he did a really nice job of you know I think one of a, the videos was shot just with his phone and mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I feel like you just I have this image in my head that you have to have it kind of production quality it has to be still and and he he kind of just showed people his his space and kind of welcomed them to his his uh basically his apartment or his house and, and started yeah. started to welcome that way. Um, so I, I've looked at a couple of those and different ones, and I kind of like, um, you know, just keeping it brief, you know, like five, six minutes, um, the length and kind of the topic focus that some of those that I've seen so far. Right. Carrie, have you seen some that you like that you thought would be a good model? Um, I, I can't say that I've seen that many that that I was like, ooh, I really like that. There are little bits of things that I, I've that I like from some and there are little bits of things that I don't like from others and, and that's mm -hmm. also how I, how I approach parenting sometimes as well. I see right. that didn't work. So I'm gonna yeah. do that. Well and I think that's a great way to learn. I mean we can learn from both positive and negative examples. Yeah. Um, and and often when an instructor comes to me uh, for a course development I'll often send them out to YouTube and say, go search your field, you know, and see what, how people are teaching it, see what, you know, uh, and then come back and tell me what you liked and what you didn't like. And that can, you know, um, again, not all courses need to look the same and not all instructors have the same vibe or the same energy or the same approach to that, to their topic. And I think that's one of the, one of the things that's important about this, this whole humanizing idea um, is that it really it really shows you, it shows, you know, you, what you bring and your enthusiasm for your subject matter. Um, and it really highlights you as, as the authority and an expert in that field as well. One of the things that Michael talks about is that he makes this distinction between connecting and performing. And that he talks about that, you know, the first time he tried being on camera, he really got this, like I mentioned before, this performance anxiety, and this idea that, he had to really up his energy and, and speak with more enthusiasm. And he just felt fake and felt like that he was putting on a show. Um, and, and I like that, 
that I've, I've felt that same thing too. If I look back on some of my early videos on my YouTube channel, it's just, what was I doing? You know, why, <laughs> why am I acting that way? Um, and, and, but when you think about it as connecting, it, one of the things that helped me a lot is, um, right now it's easy because I can talk to you too. Uh, but when you're just talking to a camera, that's, that's a lot harder. Um, and so I, I try to, uh, I try to imagine a particular student, a very specific student, and I imagine that they're really tiny and that they're inside that camera. And then I can talk to them. I also, I don't have it on this desk, at, at my desk back in Tempe, um, I've got a little Batman figurine that sits on top of my monitor, and then I can talk to Batman. And just having a, having a persona or having a, a character there that I can actually talk to um, helps me have the right inflection in my voice. I don't have to talk very loud. Batman is right there, you know? Um, and, and it, that, that changes the way I come across on camera. And so that's one of the things that I think it's really important. And I like that distinction that Michael made about connecting with your students rather than performing your, uh, for your students. How do you see that coming across in, in some of your online course developments? I, uh, I, I appreciate what you're saying about just talking to that, to that little green light or that one person idea. Mm -hmm. um, I am fine in front of a class. I, don't, I have no trouble standing up and, and talking to a class. And I can even talk to my entire department. Uh, I have to do that on a consistent basis. But uh, I, I am not a performer, have always uh, just could not ever be on stage. And uh, the idea of that, <laughs> I don't even like to, being on camera. So the idea of making videos to put out is, is just so challenging to me. Mm -hmm. But I oddly find meeting my students on Zoom in class but this mm -hmm. concept of building an entire class by video that can be taught online and asynchronously is just is is tough for me to, to wrap my persona around. Mm -hmm. So I, I am coming here to uh, try to get over that a little. That's great. That's the only way to get over it is to to be in front of the camera and to develop that comfort. Did you have some thoughts there, Randy? No, I'm good. I think that relates also to an, an idea that I've heard other people talk about, not specifically about a video, but, but a, an idea in course design and online teaching uh, referred to as psychological distance. Um, this idea of trying to reduce the psychological distance between ourselves and our students. You know, there's already a physical distance and there's already um, a technological uh, separation between us and, and anything we can do to, to make that connection like he was talking about um, and re to really think about connecting with students rather than just broadcasting or rather than just performing. Um, and it can manifest itself in so many different ways in your course design. Um, like one of the examples I already mentioned was the volume of my voice, right? If um, if you look at a lecture recording that is filmed from the back of the room and the, the lecturer is projecting a big, you know, lecture hall kind of voice, stage voice, uh, that comes across psychologically very different than if, you know, the, the volume that I would just talk to you if you were sitting across the table from me. And when we're dealing with a microphone, I mean, my microphone is eight inches from my face here. It's just out of the shot. Um, so it's actually closer than I would be to you if you were here, you know? So, um, so I, I need to talk even less loud to be, you know, to sound appropriate, um, to, to that venue, but, but how, you know, that creates a different feeling for our students than, uh, than that lecture voice, than the big projection kind of broadcast voice. Can you think of some other places in online uh, course design where that idea of, of psychological distance uh, might be addressed? I'm not sure if this is what you're looking for, um, but when I, I teach my classes in person, I am typically six to 12 to 20 feet away from them. So I'm close enough and it's, it's very 
I would start my class very informally with asking them, hey, how's it going? How's, how was your weekend? Those kind of things. Um, so I, I get to know my students and form mm-hmm. relationships with them. And, and so one of my concerns is, and I don't know if it's a legitimate concern or just a, a trepidation, is that that isn't going to happen in this way. And, and I think that a big part of, because I don't just teach one class, I teach you know, an existence for them throughout their time at, at ASU with us. So I repeatedly have to come, get to come back to them. So I, I wonder, and maybe that doesn't exist online. So maybe that's, uh, maybe that's I should just give up that, that trepidation but that I don't get to form that and build the, the trust and the relationship. So as we continue to work mm-hmm. together for the next three years, how that, that formulates. Right. Yeah, for, for me, I'm teaching a, a writing course at the moment, and I was teaching one um, in the spring too, the same course. And I think one of the places where I have a lot of, uh, I guess where the social or psychological distance is, is close in person is kind of during the writing conferences. And so I've been trying to think really hard about how I can have that similar experience online, um, whether it's maybe recording a short screencast of me going through and talking about different points of their writing that can get feedback, or whether it's having a Zoom session and showing up and doing that live. So I've been trying to kind of go back and forth and and use that feedback process is where I'm um, kind of closing that psychological distance. Right. Yeah. And I think, uh, Carrie, I think you've, you've identified a very legitimate subject is that it's very important in, in online learning um, to acknowledge the individual, to, to let, you know, to start with a welcome message. Um, courses I develop all have start with some kind of welcome message from the instructor. Uh, if possible, I like to have a welcome video. I think video is, much more personal. A lot of a lot more personality comes across in a video than uh, than in writing. I think writing with personality is is really hard to do. I mean, that's why that's why we're not all authors, right? <laughs> if we could all write with with authentic personalities, then we would all be authors, um, and that's hard to do. Uh, but video, you, you can't hide from the camera. You can't hide from the microphone. Your your personality comes through. Your mannerisms come through. The tone in your voice. The the nonverbal things in your face. All that is just natural, and it, and it comes through very, very clearly. And so I think that's important. I like to have an, an instructor welcome video. But the same is true for the students as well. You know, having them do some kind of uh, introduction discussion board uh, and encouraging them to respond with video or um, post an image, asking them things um, that aren't necessarily about the class, but, you know, what's a hobby? or if you weren't in class right now, what would you be doing? Or things like that. Just, we have to really work to intentionally humanize the, the experience. And I think that's really important. And, and, and obviously that can be taken to an extreme uh, where it's distracting from, from the course material. Um, but, but having that, the right amount of that, I think is uh, incredibly important. I think I've, I don't, I apologize if I've told this story on office hours before, <laughs> but um, when I, when I started teaching, uh, teaching in the classroom, uh, middle school level, it was really reinforced for me. And as a young teacher, I started teaching about uh, age 23, um, that I was not there to be their friend, that I had to intentionally create a professional distance. Um, and so, you know, you're not, you're not, you shouldn't be talking about your social life. You shouldn't be talking about what you did this weekend hanging out with your friends. Um, that you're there to be a teacher, you're there to be a mentor, a role model, all these other things. Um, and I think that's especially important. Uh, that probably, I mean, that's valid and important, especially as the age gap between myself and my students wasn't in, wasn't very much. Um, but I think the complete opposite is true in online, that we have to intentionally be more personal. You know, the distance is already there. The professional distance is not a concern. Uh, nobody's going to mistake me for their friend. And, and you know, um, but we, uh, you know, we almost have to work to, to move in the other direction of 
it's okay if I tell you, hey, I just came in from, you know, I was just at the gym and I'm sorry, I was, you know, <laughs> logging late to the Zoom call or, you know, something like that of, hey, I like to ride motorcycles. I'm going on a ride this weekend. Um, I'm not in danger of crossing a line and, and, you know, getting into a dangerous relationship by sharing that over Zoom or in, in my welcome discussion. And, but it, it helps to, again, change that mindset of, I'm not just taking a class from the computer, but I'm taking a class from Tim and he does this and he, you know, he lives in Chandler and he, he has dogs, you know, all those little pieces of information uh, help that. Does that kind of a, a address that concern a little bit, Carrie? Yeah, it does. I mean, my, uh, my industry tends to be more personal. So, I mean, like nobody's ever addressed by their last name. It's, you mm -hmm. know, it's only ever first names. We're, we're, we spend a lot of time together and we get to know each other. So, but I, but again, then moving online, I don't know that I want to make sure that that, that, that comfort level continues. Right. Uh, but I'm also the kind of, and I, I tell my students this the first day, I'm like, unless there's imminent danger, you do not need to touch, it, touch me. And unless you're in imminent danger, I will not touch you. I mean, working in dance, those people touch each other a mm -hmm. lot. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> that's just not my personality. And right. they don't need to know the history that has brought me to that point. But that's just my comfort level. So that doesn't happen online. So bonus. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, but I, I understand what you're saying about that that you can afford to bring in your, some more of your personality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and re research shows that that um, the student um, experience, the student rate of completion, just student success in general. Um, varies greatly with the amount of contact or with the amount of connection they have with the instructor. You know, we often place too much value, I think, on course materials. And, you know, obviously it's important to have course, good course materials, good, uh, you know, good um, instructional material, good exams, good assignments and assessments. So those are all important. Um, but those are important to learning and and where I think we're seeing that uh, the instructor presence and the instructor connection has a lot to do with student success as far as completion and just feeling valued and 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 feeling that they're doing something that's that's real. Um, I think that's important. Okay, I might be jumping ahead, and and you can tell me if I am. Feel free but, to jump uh, if. Like I said, I, I really value those those connections with the students, and I think that mm -hmm. those are important. Is, but my impression of what we're talking about uh, with building these videos and posting these classes online, um, I worry of, of the asynchronous nature that that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But maybe we're not talking asynchronous. Maybe we're talking synchronous learning. No, you're you're exactly correct that there is, um, you know, as uh, there's a lot of talk um, right now about synchronous learning online. We've just gone through a, a half a spring semester where we did a lot of synchronous online learning, and that's. But as far as online learning is concerned, that's a fairly new thing, um, and especially at ASU, um, if you're teaching what we call an I course or an O course the expectation of an online course is that it's completely asynchronous. Um, we've just launched some training and, and are exploring a new, a new concept right now called ASU Sync, where we are trying to embrace um, and improve upon the remote experience that happened in spring. Um, and I think that we will never go back to that truly fully asynchronous thing um, for a lot of people, just because we've, we've crossed this threshold, we've opened that box of realizing that there's incredible value and incredible potential in connecting to our students in real time, regardless of where they are. Um, but but the same is actually incredibly important in the, your asynchronous things too. I mean, that's why we kind of talked about uh, instructor video, uh, instructor welcome video, having the, the students introduce themselves in a discussion board. Um, and 
And I think another place that, that that kind of distance can be addressed is just in the in the language you use. If you, I've seen some courses that have very sterile, very clinical language, like students will complete this quiz. You know, students will read this novel and answer this question. Um, rather than saying something like. I think this book is important. I want you to read it. You know, just using three things, three words I used in that sentence were I and you and important, you know, and, and using it. So using, using connective words like I, we, you, uh, things like that, using emotional words like, I think this is important. I'm happy that you're enrolled in the class. If you know, it doesn't always have to be positive either. You can send an email or a post a message to say, I'm, I'm worried about some of you guys that haven't turned in your assignment yet. Or um, I'm concerned that when I look at these, uh, these portfolios that you're missing this, this element. Uh, just using those words is a, is, are, are connecting, are, they're human words. And, and so there's a lot of that humanizing that can happen in the asynchronous world as well. Tim, I'm curious I, um, kind of about that because I've seen or kind of taken some of these MOOC course, courses that are kind of for a general audience where they're, yeah. they seem a little bit dehumanizing in some of, the, some of the videos I've seen. So I wonder if people might, after watching some of those, might be apt to include some more or, or less personal language because of that model. Because I feel like I've seen that a couple times in videos. Um, where I thought, oh, maybe that's the way people uh, make videos. And so I wonder if that's kind of where that comes from. Yeah, the MOOC is an interesting, um, it's a whole different thing, right? It's, a, it's an interesting beast. Uh, and, and for those we talked about a little bit earlier about acronym soup, uh, MOOC being M-O-O-C, a multi, you might have to help me out, Randy, uh, a multi-user open online course, something like that, or a massively open online course. Um, and, and this is the, the kind of courses that are, you know, when you, when you see, you used to hear about it in the news quite a bit. I, we offer some courses like that through our, uh, CPE cont continuing professional education department. Uh, but these are courses where thousands of people can just join it and, uh, and take it kind of asynchronously completely on their own schedule, on their own pace, uh, on demand kind of education. And you see, uh, in the past, there's been big uh, hype around this. MIT uh, launched or opened up, I think, all of or a big section of their courses as this style. You know, so you weren't getting any kind of engagement from the instructor personally. You just had access to all the materials. You had access to the videos. You had access to the readings. Um, you could do the assignments, but no one was going to grade it or get back to you and that kind of thing. Um, and so that's, uh, that's one level of online learning. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, an on-demand kind of way. Um, but I, I think, and I'm glad that I think online learning has kind of moved beyond that in a lot of ways. That we're slowly coming back, and right now, not so slowly, all of a sudden, very quickly, coming back to realizing that the, the instructor is incredibly important. Like I said, research is, is reinforcing that. Um, and I know that a lot of instructors, when we first started using technology or using online learning, they were concerned, teachers were concerned that I was going to replace them. That the idea that um, that an e-learning module that you click through and answer questions was somehow going to replace the need for educators. And uh, no surprise to a lot of us, that wasn't the case. <laughs> and and it's still incredibly important that, that we have a, a personal connection and that there is a person there. Um, that is that is the the teacher that is the in a lot of ways the curator and I, I use that word a couple times when I talk about you know course design is you don't have to be the only expert and that's one of the things I like about teaching online is I can show a video of Michael Wesch I can show a video of um, Ken Robinson I can show a video of someone else I can point them to someone else's blog post or an online reading, I don't have to be the only authority, um, but I can be the curator. I can be the one to say, I think this one is important to watch. And then I can facilitate the discussion of why that wasn't important to watch. Um, 
And so that's one of the ways that I, that, that I think the, the instructor, regardless of where the instructional material is coming from, still adds a lot of value. In fact, we've had a, a couple of courses, and it, it is becoming a little bit more of a trend now, I think, um, to have, a, had to have a, a lead teacher kind of help develop a course, and, and especially at a large school like ours, um, where, and then we might have uh, faculty associates or, or graduate assistants teaching individual sections of that course. And so, so it's common to have a, a thing where the lecturer, the, the, the primary uh, resource or the primary lecturer uh, on the videos or in the course is not necessarily the teacher that's that's facilitating that that particular section and and I still think there's there's value in in both of those things. Yeah, Tim, I was just gonna go off that there. You know, this past spring I taught with another teacher and we were teaching a reading skills course, and both of us were teaching different sections of the course, mm -hmm. and we actually decided to put together short instructional videos and just each of us take turns. So we are kind of curating our own set of videos um, for that course and then kind of sharing the workload with that. And that that really, I think, made a difference in having another instructor that students were familiar with the instructor because they've taken courses with this instructor in our department, but also getting mm -hmm. a different voice. So I, I like that idea and I'm kind of curious maybe about sharing the curation, um, you know, among other faculty members who maybe are teaching in the same department. I'm kind of curious if, if at ASU you guys have actually done that or if that's kind of been facilitated through um, through you or, or just something that teachers have taken on their own. It's certainly something I'd like to see more of. I think there's, I think there's huge room for collaboration. Um, you know, especially in, in courses that are within a major or, you know, as Carrie was talking about a, a cohort, you know, if like you said, and you said too, that the other co-teacher that you had was, was uh, an instructor that the students would have had already or, or may have in the future. And so even just being more familiar with that person, that person's face, that person's name, once they get to the, that next class, that's one level of anxiety they don't have to deal with of, oh, I already know this person. Um, and so getting to know the department as a, as a department, I think is really cool. Um, and I think there, there could be a lot more of that happening. Yeah. I, one of the things that I think there sometimes is a little bit of, uh, you might call it siloing where instructors are kind of share, scared to share materials or maybe like, well, I don't know if this is a good video or something. So I think, however we can do to kind of reduce that a little bit. And like you're talking about the video making process and just saying, well, this is, I'm going to make some mistakes and kind of getting over that. Cause I've sometimes talked to other instructors and they're a little reticent to share materials because they, they either feel they're not good enough or that, you know, somebody else is benefiting from their work. So I think kind of reducing some of those barriers to collaboration is, is kind of a challenge, but definitely one worth um, working on overcoming. Yeah, that that imposter syndrome, that feeling of, of not good enough, um, that's universal to everybody. Um, it helps me to remember that. I remember um, I'm a musician. I was my music uh, was my major in the undergrad. I'm a French horn performance uh, major and, and French music education. And I remember seeing an interview with Hans Zimmer, the composer that writes a lot of film music. He did um, the film music specifically for Gladiator and on the gladiator dvd there's an interview with him and he talks about that he talks about the idea that every time he gets a new contract for a new movie he panics he says i have no idea how to do this you know um, he's an award-winning composer and yet every time he starts a new project his first thought is this is the one where they're going to realize i'm a fraud um and, and it, it helps me and not, not, you know, it's, I guess there's a little bit of schadenfreude there, but it helps me to remember that if someone at his level has this doubt and has this little bit of panic and a little bit of insecurity, then it's okay for me to have it too. And, and that, you know, if he can get through it, I can get through it. Um, and I, and I think there's that, that level of when something's recorded and maybe it's, maybe it's, because of tradition and, and history, 
um, because we're what we're used to seeing. But when something's recorded, we kind of elevate it a little bit as far as it's real now or it's permanent or, um, you know, because we what we see on the news or what we see on TV is of that high, high production quality. Um, we kind of get this idea that something that we make that's going to be viewed on a TV has to be of that same production quality. Um, and I think slowly we're getting away from that as YouTube is, you know, becoming a thing and as uh, video blogging uh, becomes a thing and we just get used to seeing each other. And especially right now where the majority of our interaction with each other is through a camera and through a screen, we're just getting used to that. And, and you know, and we watch news now. We watch Jimmy Fallon. We watch, you know, the, the people that we're used to seeing uh, through the lens of um, million dollar productions we're now seeing doing their same talk shows and news reports through Zoom, just like we are. You know, it's it's incredibly leveling, right? Uh, to see everybody using the same tool and everybody leveled to the same quality of camera or, you know, using their headset microphone or whatever. Um, and so I think that's probably very beneficial of, of because we're, we're changing our expectations. Um, but, but it's important, I think, also to remember that that's the way that students see us in class, the way we are with our ums and ahs and with our hair however it is and, you know, with whatever we choose to wear on a daily basis. That's what they're used to seeing. You know, that's normal. That's human. And it's hard for us to learn to be human on camera. And I think, uh, and, I, and probably not just on camera, but, but uh, you know, in our, like I mentioned before, in our writing, in the way we uh, correspond with students. Uh, the kind of the formality of email is, is starting to change, um, especially with new tools like Slack and Instant Messenger and, uh, you know, chat rooms like we have in Zoom. There's different levels of formality in even our written language, which is kind of a new idea. Um, historically written things were much more formal. And uh, so that's an interesting, interesting thing of realizing that this is just a digital capture of real life. And if we can be comfortable with that, um, then that changes our, our outlook on, on what we're recording and how we're recording it. Um, if you get a chance to, to listen to the podcast, I think you'll enjoy it. One of the things that, that Wesh mentions, and uh, I'd kind of traveled down a rabbit hole of, of watching some of his other YouTube videos, so I, I may be referring to something that wasn't actually in the podcast, but... Um, someone interviewed his students and asked them about which video they thought was like the most impactful or the most memorable to them after, after taking his course. Um, and consistently the ones that they mentioned were not the ones that were the high production value ones. I mean, he does, he does as, you know, as he's gotten more comfortable with making video, he's, he's done some things and he talks about, um, you know, he takes his camera and, talks through a lesson while he's running a marathon or, um, you know, takes his camera out, uh, to a location. He took it, you know, he did some travels and, and took it, you know, to, uh, Thailand or to other places and just kind of talked about things as he walks through, you know, he's a anthropology instructor. So he's talking about these cultures as he's walking around in the culture. Um, and, and that's one of his big ideas is his YouTube channel is called classrooms without walls or teaching without walls, something like that. Um, and, and I think that's just that, that important thing of the, the, the videos that the students connected with the most were the least formal ones and the least complex ones. The ones where he was just, you know, at a location, but talking to them. And, and it, it was interesting. One of the specific uh, techniques that he talked about was using students' names, using uh, referring to their work of, hey, when I was when I was looking through last week's discussion, I noticed that Randy said this, and I really liked that he had this approach. Um, I was looking at uh, as I was grading the quizzes, I noticed that Carrie did an outstanding job, and she really you know brought up her her performance this week, and and just even just the use of names, um, it, it it makes that it, it it makes that a connection, and it makes it more personal. And you also know that, that that video is just for you. You know, that's not something that he recorded three years ago and uses every term. Uh, and that's also a downfall of that kind of approach is now you, you're making video every time. Um, but if you, if you can kind of let go of that idea that it has to be a huge production quality, 
that, um, and I've, I've, I've talked with a few different people, they have different names for this. He called it super simple video. I've heard people refer to it as instant video or disposable video. Um, but just this idea that you record it and you post it and then you throw it away and you don't worry about the quality because the quality is not the important part that the content is, the discussion is, um, the message that you're delivering to students. And if, and that's kind of freeing that way, right? If you, if you can kind of get past that idea that it's going to last. And I think that's what we, we're concerned about when, when we record something is this is going to be online forever. And, you know, some future employer might see this or, um, but if it, if it's not intended to be around forever, and I think we're, we're slowly realizing that even things that are on the internet forever, they're not relevant forever and they kind of just fade away. I think most, most people are only concerned with what's the most recent thing you've done. <laughs> um, but, but in a course, you know, if it's in Canvas, if it's unlisted, if it's, if it's, you know, something that you're developing specifically for your students, not publishing to the world, um, then that can be a lot of really freeing and take a lot of that pressure off of, it doesn't need to be great. I just am going to turn on my phone, talk to my students and post it. Um, and then next semester I'll do the same. Now, obviously there's some different uses for that. I, I wouldn't do it my entire lecture that way. Uh, yeah, but for those kind of student response videos or a welcome message, Hey, welcome to the course or welcome to week three. I, I really like that approach of just using that, uh, that super simple or that, that disposable video approach. Have you tried something like that, Randy? I haven't. I, I think uh, most of my videos have been a little bit more on the, um, here's a, a bit of content, here's a couple of points that I'm explaining or, or like welcome overview videos. Um, mm -hmm. But I definitely want to try that out. I think that I could see a room for that in some instances of my course, or especially, you know, I was, I was thinking about the writing feedback and just mentioning a couple things as like, here's kind of what you've done this week. And here's what I've noticed in point out students by name. I kind of like that idea. And so uh, I'm hopefully going to put it to use uh, either this week or next week. Yeah, I'd, I'd be, and I'd be interesting to hear interested to hear your response on that and, and your feedback. And just having, you know, we're comfortable doing things in real time. And sometimes it, it something seems harder um, when it's when it's not a real time exercise. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking specifically, I'm not I'm not using my words very well right now. Um, but I'm thinking specifically of a, an instructor emailed me today and said, here's a link to my course. Could you take a look and give me some feedback? And my first thought was, okay, I don't have time for that right now, but I'll put it on my list and then I'll, and then I'll get to it. And then I thought, what if I just started a screen recording, clicked the link and gave myself a time limit? Like I'm going to do this for 10 minutes and I'm going to give him 10 minutes worth of feedback as I look through his course. You know, all of a sudden I've got 10 minutes. And if I know that it's only going to be that long, um, and all of us, and that's going to be very organic. That's not going to be a very long video for him to watch. And, and probably I'm going to give him more feedback in 10 minutes than he can do with right now anyway. Um, so five minutes might even be adequate. And, uh, and all of a sudden that was really freeing. Like I don't need to plan an outline and write an email and take some screenshots and show him things. I can just turn on my camera and talk to him. Um, and then that way I, I can set a time limit. I can, it can be, you know, it can help strengthen and reinforce the relationship I working relationship I have with this person. Um, and if he needs to watch it again, he can, you know, it's so I think that's what I'm going to do. Um, and I, and just that, that decision to do something in real time rather than make it a product like, sure, I've got, I've got this much time. Let me look through your course and record the, the experience. And I think that's one of the things that I, I think more online instructors, more instructors in general, I, I think we're starting to see a blending of just being a teacher and being an online teacher. Um, but more instructors in, in general just could embrace this idea of doing things in real time, making things less formal in a lot of ways can still be just as impactful. And, and it may be more, more impactful in some other ways. I think that's a good point, Tim. I feel like sometimes, uh, 
some of the reasons I don't make videos or I might put off or, or say, you know, I don't have time for that is because I feel like there has to be maybe like I have to draw out a script or I have to plan out bullet point by bullet point. What are the things I'm going to talk about and kind of think about maybe if I'm going to try to include a little bit of assessment or like a poll or something like that. And, mm -hmm. and so maybe I, I think I go a little bit too far in the overproduce realm of it. And I really mm -hmm. like your message, kind of what you've been talking about today about, you know, just kind of being live and, um, with a little bit less planning. So I, I, I really like that approach. Yeah. I give you permission to be less formal. I think there is a place, you know, obviously there's a place for some of that planning and some of that, that production. I try to weigh it on a, on a scale of how long am I going to use something? Like if I'm, if I'm developing a, a lecture uh, 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 that has slides or demonstration or something like that, something that is a, that is truly a direct instruction piece, um, then yeah, maybe doing a little bit of scripting, maybe doing, uh, you know, setting up the lights correctly, maybe you know, creating some slides with, with some diagrams or doing some editing is going to be valuable. I, I try to th think of things as a, a time investment and versus, you know, versus the payoff. Right. So if, if I invest four hours in producing a video that I can then use for like five years, then then that pays off. Right. I don't have to do that lecture anymore. I don't have to do that demonstration anymore. In fact, I can probably put more effort to do it better that one time um, and then and then not ever do it again for a while until I change my curriculum or until tools change or until, you know, something changes. Um, and so if, if it is something that I'm going to use year after year, term after term, then it's probably worth it to invest a little bit more in that production. Um, but at the same time, like I said, there's, there's going to be that threshold of diminishing returns where it's not going to get better um, if I have a better microphone or if I um, invest in a better backdrop or something like that. The, the instructional content is going to be the same the engagement with my students still going to be the same. So, um, yeah, so that is one of those things that finding that balance of formal and informal pr uh, preparation and on the fly. Um, but I think, yeah, in general, probably a lot of instructors could benefit from giving themselves per permission to be less formal. How do you see that uh, applying in, in your situation, Carrie? Well, I, I have to say that my, my first thought is, uh, um, the, you know, growing up being mentored in, as I came out of education, uh, someone very wisely said to me, never put in writing something that you don't want your mother and your aunt to read. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, I have, boy, that's been a guiding principle in my life. Um, and like, I don't post on social media things that can be, interpreted or misinterpreted um i rarely post at all uh but then the idea of making me these videos that are just giant permanent records of everything i said is just oh it, it scares the big jesus out of me mm -hmm. um but uh and, and i don't really like to be on camera but uh so the idea that if i can limit their availability only on canvas while I'm still, like, I could actually be shaking right now, um, makes it a little more palatable to me. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm, I'm working on is what baby steps. Um, so, and, and, you know, we're, we're, I don't know what SLU is telling you, uh, Randy, but, you know, we're being told that we're going to be online, but synchronously online, that not all of our students are in person, but not all of our students will be in person. So we're going to be teaching synchronously. Um, so I'm okay with giving my lectures and making it work for the students on Zoom. Like I've, mm -hmm. I've worked out those plans. I'm still working on the concept of how to teach what I teach without students uh, because what I teach is, is very project-based and very hands-on. So how to give them that experience is, is not something that the industry and I have necessarily melded away to do. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I've been, you know, I've spent a good part of, since we've been online, uh, being in contact with experts and in my industry and saying, because I teach lighting design and staging and uh, working with the manufacturers and working with software designers of how can we really give them this experience of how this impacts, how making these lighting choices impacts their performance choices. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so how to put those two things together when they can't be together. And that's incredibly challenging. So, uh, yeah, you know, I can talk about it till I'm blue in the face, but unfortunately it loses a lot when it's not a direct experience. And I'm mm-hmm. still trying to figure out how to make up for that. And, and that's yeah. my biggest concern about doing this all online. I can make videos about me talking about it. I can talk and talk for days. Mm-hmm. but I don't know how to give them the hands-on actual experience. And that's my biggest concern because I think that's the biggest impact. Yeah, that is a challenge. Um, one of the things that, that uh, again, when you get a chance to, to look at the podcast or, or look at, at Michael Wesh's materials, he talks about this idea that breaking free from the idea that online learning, everything has to happen on the screen on the computer. Um, we have a lot of, I've helped, um, probably even carry some of your colleagues. Uh, we have, we have some courses on walking. I'm working with a course, uh, um, an art course that's on walking. I've also helped develop a dance course. That's again on, on walking. Um, and a lot, yeah, Cynthia's class. Yeah. And a lot of the assessments are not electronic assessments. They're, uh, go do this walk, you know, develop a, uh, you know, and so part of it might be mapping, choosing where your walk is. Uh, part of it might be go do this walk and then reflect on this aspect of your experience. What smells did you smell? Uh, if you do the walk during the day, what's different than if you do the walk in the evening? Um, you know, some of those things. So you're going out in the world and doing things and then capturing that or reporting back or reflecting in writing or something like that. So I'm wondering, Carrie, if, if there wouldn't be something in, in your, in your domain there where they might be able to go stage up some lights and position some objects in different ways and, and see how that affects things. I mean, I think you're taking it to the next level and saying, how does that affect character choices and acting choices and things like that as well? Um, but I'm wondering if there might be some things just in that concept of breaking away from the screen and, and not necessarily thinking about it as an electronic activity, um, but as a physical real world activity that then they can report back to you through the, through the computer. Yeah. And, and I'm, I, initially I'm like, no, that's just not going to work. Uh, I, I'm still, I'm still trying to do it uh, yeah. because, you know, I teach in the theater. So I have an entire lighting rig set up. They have a light board in class. So Mm. they literally can create, you know, they have 96 channels. They have 147 lights to play with. They have an an infinite number of colors to choose from. Um, So I have, um, and I'm working with a software designer actually who uh, has created a bunch of simulators, but hasn't gone far enough for what I need. Um, mm-hmm. And and he's he said he'd work on that, and he's made some great strides. And and all of this is like just within the community of the industry of yeah, I want to help you out, which is right. fantastic. But uh, so what I need them to do, my expectation of what we've done in the past is not possible for them to do going forward without being inside the theater. Yeah. Um, so, you know, while I can say, okay, what if you shine your light through, if you have a blue scarf in your house, mm-hmm. how does that change the effect? But that doesn't give them the idea of, there are literally 68 shades of blue, mm-hmm. which one is most impactful for what you're trying to achieve. Right. You know, that's a little more challenging. <laughs> But that's yeah. also maybe I just can't be as detailed in that practicality part of it. Another conversation I often have with faculty is this idea that coming to grips 
and doing a little bit of acknowledging that what you did in person isn't going to work online. And, you know, we can go through the grieving stages of that and, 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 and deny that and then be angry about that. And then, and then at some point we just come around to say, okay, what I did before isn't going to work. Um, and that's frustrating, but taking a step back and, and, tr and, and you probably have heard this from instructional designers before this is a very typical instructional design question. What's the learning objective, right? What, what, by doing this thing that I've always done in class, what, knowledge or experience or realization am I really trying my students to have, what, trying to get my students to have? Mm -hmm. um, and then looking at the tools and, and resources available to you and saying, what other ways can they get that experience? What other ways can they achieve that knowledge or uh, come to that realization? And, and, and hopefully there's a way that that, that can happen, but it, but it does, it takes that stepping back and saying, what am I really trying to accomplish? Right. Um, because and the completion of the exercise is not the goal. The learning of something from it is. Yeah. Um, and sometimes there's a there's a another way to that. Yeah. And and that's what I'm trying to work on, particularly with this with this uh, simulator. But mm -hmm. uh, I am still in process. I fully admit that I am still deep in that process. It's always a process. Randy's way cooler than me. It's okay. Randy's on that process too. We talked a couple of weeks ago about his, his process. <laughs> I don't even know what te classes I'm teaching in the fall yet. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to be a quite a ways behind you when, when I do find out. Carrie, I'm going to drop in the chat room a link, um, my scheduling link that will, is connected to my calendar. If you want to uh, schedule a, an appointment with me, we can talk more specifically about, about your course. Thanks, Tim. Um, and also uh, Bill Partland and Joya. Mm -hmm. I've worked with them also. If uh, they're probably, you, are they in your department as well? They are, yeah. And yeah uh, so they might be. Bill is my other artistic director. I cool. have three artistic directors now, and he's one of them. Nice. I did see that we had someone put a question into the Q&A, so I want to make sure we get to that before we wrap up. Um, was it one of you or was it someone else? That's fun. Uh, that, that was, that was my question, Tim. I was okay, just... cool. Um, so your, your question, it says, I'm curious about, uh, using pause and questions between presenting content and videos versus having students do it at the end of the instructional video. Uh, so you're talking about, I'm doing a presentation. I ask a question and, and then wait for a period of time while they reflect or while they do a task. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yes, yeah, similar to that, or I know that some some video editors, we I use Panopto and they have like the embedded uh, questions where you can, if you don't get it right, it actually sends you back to an earlier part of the video. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that's getting a little bit in the weeds with techni technical stuff, but I'm just wondering from an instructional design standpoint, you know, is there is there kind of some resource to support that being a little more effective or maybe presenting the whole video and then doing maybe a couple of comprehension or uh, questions at the end, mm -hmm. you know, designing like, a like this. Yeah. I like that idea of uh, asking the question in the context. I think there's a, there's a probably a lot of learning value and, and psychological things we could, we could study more there. Um, you know, if the intention is, evaluating their recall, then waiting to the end and seeing what stuck with them is different. Um, if the intention is to clarify misunderstanding or to uh, really drive something home uh, to try to solidify that knowledge, then asking right then is, is going to be more beneficial, right? Um, so if I'm, I'm talking about something and then a, a, a question comes up on the screen that asks me which of these tr is true about what I just said, um, then it really reinforces with them, oh, that was important what he just said. And I didn't realize that there was a distinction there, you know, or, you know, so, and if they get the question wrong, like you said, Panopto, uh, Camtasia, some of these, uh, Ed Puzzle, I think is another one where you can create, uh, these interactive video elements that depending on what they click, it could allow them to go on or maybe send them back or maybe just give them some feedback. Say, no, that wasn't it, you know? 
um, and then and then allow them to go on. Um, so I like that idea of um, of reinforcing content by asking questions, even if you don't want to go through the the highly technical step of embedding that quiz. And Panopto does a, a pretty good job of that. Other tools um, other tools are a little bit harder. Um, but even just bringing up a slide that asks them to a reflect on a question, you know, uh, even if they're just answering the question in their head and then getting the feedback, it still has that formative effect of clarifying that misunderstanding or reinforcing that concept as being important. Um, so I like that. Um, I think that's a that's a good a good uh, practice. Thinking of it as a formative experience. Um, don't try to extract grades from that. I mean, I, I know a lot of people, and I know that Panopto now can. Uh, export the the data from those quizzes back to your Canvas gradebook, um, but I just I think that's pushing the I think that that kind of experience needs to be formative. It needs to be low stakes or no stakes. It needs to be you, you shouldn't have to be worried if you're if you got it right or not. It, the whole point is to confirm your knowledge or correct a misunderstanding or like I said uh, reinforce a point. So treat it like a formative thing. You could use Panopto or you could just ask the question. Um, I've seen some instructors that actually have a, like a Canvas quiz that, that then they fill out the Canvas quiz as they watch the video. And in Canvas, you can actually embed a quiz right in the, you know, in the content editor that shows up above the quiz questions. So you could have a video embedded in the quiz that they're watching and then answering the questions as they go. Um, so that could be a way if you really wanted that to be a, a graded experience um, keep it formative, keep it fairly low stakes, um, and maybe have, you know, multiple, multiple attempts available. Um, but it, it's also pretty low stakes if you're, you know, asking the question in the context of the answer, then and the, if they're following along. And, and that can kind of help to reinforce, uh, not reinforce isn't the right word, help to make sure that they are following along uh, just from a compliance uh, perspective. So... Yeah, I like it. Well, we're just right at an uh, hour and three minutes here, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I want to thank both of you for coming and having this conversation with me. Um, Carrie, what's what's uh, one idea that you're going to take away from here? That uh, I should be okay with making videos to share with my class. <laughs> I know that's so <laughs> basic to you, but it's such a huge idea to me. And I, and I think should is a strong word. I mean, should is, uh, my, uh, my therapist would say should is a shameful word, right? <laughs> but I, I think, um, and I'll, well, I'll go to Randy first and then I'll, and I'll give my, my uh, tidbit here. What, what's one thing that you're going to take away from this, Randy? Um, I like kind of what you were talking about, giving yourself permission to maybe have a little bit more unscripted uh, video making process. And so I'm excited to put that to use a little bit more in my course and kind of get past that maybe internal editor that tells me it needs to be production quality video. Yeah. 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 So, so to go back to Carrie's comment of, of, of should, um, I think if I, if you replace that with can, that you can do this, that, 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 and, and, and I was going to say exactly what Randy said, you have permission to make informal video, to make, uh, to be human in your course is, is not only allowed, it's good. And, and it's something that all of us need to strive for, especially as, as the distance between us and our students is increasing, um, that the, the human nature, the, the human, wow, I'm losing my words today. The, the humanism, I'm sure that's the wrong word, but the, <laughs> um, the personality that comes through our course has to increase. Because uh, so that we can reduce that psychological dif uh, distance um, and make that connection with our students, and if we can again focus on that that distinction between connection and performance, um, then then that's a makes a big difference as well. So, excellent, good conversation. Anyone that's watching this video out on on YouTube or Facebook, wherever you find this, um, we record and have this conversation weekly at. Uh, 1 p.m. on Thursday afternoon. Uh, next week might be a little bit late because I'm actually um, hosting a 12 to 1 workshop. Um, so as quickly as I can hang up one workshop and get over to this, uh, we'll get going. But we will have it. 
Um, if you'd like to join us, uh, the Zoom link is in the description of the video. We also have a Facebook group um, where I post all the videos and all the announcements. And then just this week, I did something a little bit differently, and I posted the link to the notes document out um, so that even people that aren't on the call could ask uh, their questions on the document. Um, and so if, if you're not really comfortable being on the Zoom call, but you still want to get some questions answered, um, look for that look for that document and you can add your questions there as well. We want to get as many people involved as, as possible. I think we won't see a, a time where we get so many people that it will be inefficient, but if it, it does, that's a good problem to have. So thank you, Carrie and Randy, for joining, and we'll see you guys next time.